Good afternoon. I am Eric Jaworski, FLAVA Teacher Education and Professional Development Committee Chair. Thank you for joining us for today's FLAVA webinar, Catch Em All, Proficiency Principles for Every Learner with Rebecca Blue Wolf. Actful 2020 National Language Teacher of the Year, Rebecca is a national board certified teacher of French whose work has also been featured in Actful's national publication, The Language Educator. Before joining the large suburban middle school outside Boston, where she now teaches, she interned at a small independent school on Cape Cod and worked as an assistant de langue via a Fulbright teaching scholarship in Saint-Omer, France. She holds a BA magnum cum laude from Brown University and an MED from Harvard Graduate School of Education. Her article, Reinvigorating Teaching Toward a Student-Centered Classroom, was featured in the March-April issue of Actful's The Language Educator and was written up in the April 16, 2015 issue of the Marshall Memo. In today's FLAVA webinar, Rebecca will share with us strategies that reach all learners, particularly in hybrid and remote settings, and how to keep our focus on proficiency and developing learners' language performances in the current learning environment. It is an honor to introduce to you Rebecca Blue Wolf. Thanks, Eric. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry I can't see your faces, but I am so happy to see many familiar names among the attendees. And I just want to welcome you here and just say how humbled I am that any teacher this year has had space to do more professional learning and that you would choose to spend some of that time with me. So I'm delighted. I'm going to try to make the best use of this hour that I possibly can. And let's just dive right in. I've got some contact information for you here. I'm quite active on Twitter, so that's always a good place to find me and see what I'm thinking about and working on in my classroom. Then I've also got my email address for you here. And I do have a blog where I feature my thematic units for middle school French. So if you are a middle school French teacher, that may be of interest to you after our session together today. And that's just a picture of me in front of my middle school. So I wanted us to sort of start by kind of just getting into the headspace that is what it means to try to do better as a teacher in our current environment. And this is a quote from one of my personal educational heroes, Jennifer Gonzalez, whose blog and podcast Cult of Pedagogy have been really helpful to me in improving my practice. And she says that we should think about teaching in this COVID world as a massive project in beta. It's going to be messy. And I fully expect that all of you have experienced many, many messes this school year as I have. But she encourages us to continue to experiment, to fall apart on the days when it's our turn and to keep giving ourselves and our students grace. And the message at the end is the one that I really kind of need to tell myself as I think about getting through 180 days of school this year is that we're getting through this. And some days are good and some days are terrible, but there are one, it's one more day down and to me, that means one day closer to getting back to something like the school work that I know and love. So I am coming to you today to present not as an expert. I have been not teaching online for any longer than you have. I began this journey on March 13th. And uh, when I look back at my lessons now from what I was doing then, I can already see I've grown a lot. Um, and I still have a ways to go. So I'm just going to kind of share what I've been working on and um, hopefully give some ideas that are adaptable to your individual setting, language, and level. And this is another quote that's been kind of sticking me with, with me this year. And I think I was just hearing from Eric and Heidi that in Virginia, you're in a situation where many of you are about to transition back into hybrid learning and having students in school with you after many of you have been remote or partially remote for this year. And I think there's so much about the current teaching environment over which we have no control. And that, at least for me, has been very disconcerting and stress causing. And so, you know, I just kind of wanted to bring the serenity prayer, no matter your religious or non-religious background, but this idea of sort of trying to seek serenity to accept the things that we cannot change, because there's a lot about this year that is way, way beyond our control. Um, and then also at the same time, trying to find that courage to think about the things that we can influence 
and and really feeling like we have some strength to to take initiative in in our realms of control. But of course, that takes the wisdom to know the difference. And so I know um, I have spent many evenings and early mornings laying in bed awake worrying about if my students are going away over break and if they're eating with people outside of their households and if their masks are really good enough. And the fact is I can't, I can't change any of those things. So instead I just need the courage to put on four shirts so that I can teach with open windows in Massachusetts in the dead of winter. And I need to have the courage to stay up late at night to pack a lunch that I can eat easily in my car and to just try to you know, exert influence where I can so that I can have a safe and successful year for my students and for me. Um, so I just invite you to sort of reflect on that throughout the year and certainly throughout this time together this afternoon. So I have two goals for us. The first is really looking, as Eric mentioned, at those strategies that reach all learners, focusing on examples that work in remote and hybrid settings. And I'll just say our school has been hybrid since the end of September. So four days a week, we teach half of our students in person in, they're in two cohorts. And when we have students half the class in front of us, we have the other half of the class on Zoom. So it's that Zoom in room concurrent style of teaching which if there are any moms, working moms on this webinar, it's that same thing of like, I am doing everything badly right now because I'm trying to meet too many needs at once. Um, so it can be very frustrating and it's a lot of juggling, uh, but I will share what I've been doing in that setting that is sort of getting us through it. And at the same time as thinking about those strategies, I, I do think now more than ever that focusing on proficiency is our way forward. It's our way of meeting our learners where they are at and then figuring out what's the next logical step for them in our learning sequences. So we're gonna look a little bit about what that means to focus on proficiency in our current environment and then thinking about how we can develop our students' language, language performances in that setting. And so I'm just going to kind of dig into this first part about strategies for all learners. And I just want to invite you, if something sparks a question, please, please feel free to use the chat. Uh, you, can, you can share it just to the panelists, or if you want to share it to attendees and panelists, you're more than welcome to. But Eric and Heidi promise to be on the lookout for questions, and I'll be pausing throughout the presentation to hear what's bubbling up for you in the chat. So feel free at any time to pop a question in there. So what I wanted to bring today in terms of strategies for all learners is to think about four of my favorite strategies from Robert Marzano, who is not a world language educator, but who has done some really amazing meta research on of all the different things we know about teaching, all the different strategies, what are the ones that consistently work across age groups, across subject matters. And in his book, he comes up with nine. I'm just going to pick four of those and give you some examples of how they can be adapted to my middle school French classroom, and I think therefore to your world language classroom, no matter the language or level. And I think you'll see that these strategies pair very well with current best practices around proficiency and using authentic resources and integrated performance assessments. I don't think Marzano necessarily knows much about world language education, but what he's choosing to focus on plays very nicely with what we're working on in our field as well. So this first strategy is all about guiding students to identify similarities and differences. And in Marzano's research, this practice is associated with a 45% increase in achievement, which is really tremendous. And I think something worth paying attention to. We have, at least in my case, much less time with our students this year. And I think if we wanna make the greatest impact with that time, we wanna think about what are the most powerful strategies in our repertoire. And so this, to my mind, is certainly one of them. And Marzano's uh, quite clear in his explanation that this is not just saying to kids, notice what's the same, notice what's different, but really explicitly guiding students to pay attention to similarities and differences. And that is what enables them to really use the knowledge that we're providing in our courses. So I wanna look at this through a couple different lenses in the world language classroom. And the first is to think about opportunities for students to do comparing and contrasting work between uh, their own cultures and target culture. So this is an example from my French seven class, which has a novice high target. 
And as part of our family unit, we take a deep look at pets and pet adoption. That's just been kind of a very sweet place for my students to spend time and think about family in a way that is not as stressful and upsetting as sometimes our own families can be. And so we um, study a French website for pet adoption and students get familiar with the whole setup of that website and the profiles and okay, you always have the picture of the animal and its name and its age and the region where it lives and its personality and its birthday and um, the type of dog it is and all these things. And then eventually once they're really familiar with that website and they've researched a number of pets, they do what we call a double bubble, comparing and contrasting that pet with either a pet at home or another pet on the website. And so if you're familiar with that Venn diagram, this is very much in the same spirit. But what I like about this type of thinking map is, you know, when you do the Venn, the overlap area is so small, it kind of discourages you from looking for things that are similar because you're never gonna cram them in that little space. But with a double bubble, you know, you've got your two pets here, everything that they have in common goes in the middle. And then everything that's different goes off to the sides. So for students with any sort of visual organization issue, this can be a much easier way to set up and use a graphic organizer. If students have access to an app like Poplet or Inspiration, we're a one-to-one -one school and our students are able to create these thinking maps using their iPads. And the setup here is such that students are getting practice with the third person singular and plural because they're talking about each of the pets and their unique characteristics and then they're saying what they have in common. So there's some nice language opportunities there for students to do describing work and um, having this kind of thinking map also ensures that students are sort of comparing apples to apples. So if each student prepares a thinking map about two pets, and then we could think about playing that forward into maybe a conversation task. If every student has the same kind of thinking map set up, it makes it much easier for them to exchange information. So that can be a powerful strategy for ensuring that every student kind of has a voice at the table when you're doing this kind of comparing and contrasting work. So that is one sort of way to look at similarities and differences. Another would be to think about linguistic comparisons that we might be able to um, draw students' attention to. So I wanted to give you an example from thinking about um, adjectives. In French, students learn how adjectival agreement varies by number and gender. And so one way to have them start exploring that, in the past, I used to just give them a bunch of tweets that showed different descriptions of clothing, because this was part of a clothing fashion unit, and just have them notice the differences. But this year, given the remote environment, I'm really loving Jamboard as a way for students to sort of physically manipulate pieces of information to show their understanding. So for this one, I created a Jamboard, which is just um, part of the Google suite of apps, where the background of the board is that division of masculine singular, feminine singular, plural adjectives. And then I had lots and lots of tweets that I'd collected and this was from the good old days of in-person teaching. And then I was able to just pile all the tweets into the Jamboard and then have students do the work of observing and sorting oh, which of these do I think are masculine? Which of these do I think are feminine? And this is before I've ever said anything explicit to students about how the grammar of adjectival endings works. But this is really, it's sort of in the spirit of like a pace style lesson, just trying to get them to notice. And so once they've grouped these, then we were able to do a lesson saying, okay, now what do you notice about how adjectives function in French? What is the normal pattern for an adjective? What are some of the strange adjectives you noticed? Did you notice some adjectives that never changed at all? And again, setting this up in a table, looking for what is same and different, draws students' attention to what's most important and provides a reference for them going forward in their own language production. So just kind of a different way to think about looking at similarities and differences, whether it's through cultural comparisons or linguistic comparisons. So that was the first strategy. And now I want to take you to a second strategy, summarizing and note taking. And this one, Marzano associates with a 34% increase in achievement. So also a lot of bang for your buck. So I think definitely something worth doing. But again, I think in our remote environment, the way that we're asking students to summarize or note take may look a little bit different. 
So I just wanted to, um, again, bring a sort of thinking map that might be useful here. And what Marzano tells us about summarizing and note taking is that what matters is that teachers are providing questions that are helping students notice what's important. Okay, so when we think about students who may struggle in world language classes, they may not be able to focus on the most important information, right? They may be sort of losing losing the forest for the trees. And so anytime we can provide a thinking map that gives students a frame for this is what you're supposed to be comparing, this is what you need to be noticing, that's very, very helpful. So this is one that you could use really with any sort of narrative song, any story, any, any narrative that you're exploring and having them try to break it down, title, characters, author. Um, this one was sort of with a fairy tale. So what's the magic element in the story that comes up sometimes when we're doing folk tales. And then again, the beauty here is that if every student is using the same graphic organizer, it's very easy to pair students up or to put them in small groups and have them compare the information on the map. And then this can be a graphic organizer that students use as a base for a subsequent writing or speaking task. And that's going to be very helpful for any sort of issue with students with low working memory, students with anxiety, students who sort of get to that production moment in class and kind of all of a sudden can't remember what they want to say or don't have a place to start. And so I think this year in particular, really relying heavily on thinking maps and graphic organizers as a way of making sure that all the students know what am I supposed to be paying attention to here and that you're creating this for a purpose like hopefully the creation of the story map is not the end of the task but rather this is where you're gathering the important information so that we can do something with it and, and that's the springboard that you're going to have. Another way that we can do some summarizing and note taking to draw students attention to important information is, for example, if you have any sort of project where students have researched different information, then you might want to have some sort of moment that the students are presenting that information, perhaps in small groups, while gr other group members are taking notes. So in my French 8 class, which has an intermediate low target, we do a big project on Quebec City at the beginning of the year. And each student creates an itinerary for places they would like to visit in Quebec City and events they would like to attend. And then I used to have them get up in front of the whole class and do this very painful presentation that would take forever. And they would be so nervous and everyone else would be having a hard time paying attention. And then I realized not everyone needs to hear everyone's presentation. We can do this in groups of five simultaneously and I can walk around with my clipboard or these days I can hop from breakout room to breakout room and just kind of listen in and take notes where uh, at the same time as students are sharing out about their projects. And then I would give a graphic organizer like this to each student so that they know what to listen for from their classmates. And you'll notice that the headings here are in French. They say things like, what's the name of the attraction? What is it? Where is it? And I'm giving that to students so that they can stay in the target language. And if they miss information during the presentation, they already have the target language question in front of them to ask whatever it is that they missed. I was observed during this lesson a number of years ago and students fell back into English when they missed information and were trying to catch it from classmates. And so my supervisor, Tim Egan, had a wise suggestion, which is why don't you just put the headings in French, then they know what to say and it just keeps them in the language that much longer. And then the kids know you're taking notes on this because eventually we're going to have a group interpersonal speaking assessment where we're going to talk about what are the best places to visit and all these notes are going to be a valuable reference for you. So again, the note taking needs to, at least in my experience, serve a purpose so that students will kind of buy into why, sh why should I be doing this? Why am I taking notes? Is this just busy work to keep me quiet while my classmates give over information. But I would argue by having these notes, that really takes the cognitive load off of students. And when it comes time for the subsequent speaking or writing activity, they're not trying to remember, wait, did, did Eric talk about the Chateau Frontenac? Did Heidi say that it was near the hotel? Like, I don't need them to memorize those things. That's not what matters. I need them to be able to talk about that information. So I'm going to make sure they have it written down somewhere where they can reference it and use it. So that was just the first two strategies. If there are questions that are coming up for you, please feel free to share them in the chat. And again, you wanna put that to all panelists and attendees so that everyone can see. And Eric and Heidi, is there anything that I should address at this point before we move yeah, on? Yeah, we've got some in the Q&A, Rebecca. So first one is, are you, and this is going back to the poplet. Yeah. They wanna know, 
Jamie would like to know, are you able to distinguish between the website's pet and the student's pet in the double bubble? I am because one of the things they say is where the pet lives. So if it lives in a French region, then it's not the child's pet, for example. Um, but for me, it's really not so important which pet is whose. It's more that they're able to describe them. Awesome. Let's see, we have another question and Suzanne would like to know, how do your students in class work in groups but are, can still be socially distant? So my students do not work in groups in class beyond groups of two or three. For an activity like sharing out about the projects, I would probably have all my students on Zoom and you might not be allowed to do this. So this, this is one example of how to make it work. I would have mixed groups, half Zoomies, half roomies. So like two or three of each and they're in a breakout room talking to each other. And, and maybe Heidi's sitting next to me and she's in my breakout room or maybe Heidi's across the, across the classroom for me and she happens to be in my breakout room. But in, in terms of trying to build community in the class between the cohorts, I'm trying to create mixed groups when possible. That said, if it's a paired activity, that I'm able to do socially distance. The kids, they just need to learn to talk really loudly through their masks. Like again and again, I just find myself being like, please shout, just shout it out. Um, so the kids, if I've got 12 kids in class, I can have six pairs working in class and then I can create six breakout rooms for the 12 kids on Zoom and they can be doing that simultaneously. So depending on whether or not you're allowed to have your in-person students get on Zoom, th those are kind of the two models that I've been playing with. Awesome. And one final question was Layla Lou wanted to know if you could share the names of the programs or the apps that you use to create those graphic organizers again. Sure. So the two that we're using, and there's nothing magic about them, it's just that's what's on our kids' iPads. The one that you saw was called Poplet. There's also another one that my students sometimes use called Inspiration. And it's certainly perfectly fine to just have them do it on a piece of paper. The beauty with all of these setups is first you write and then you draw the circle. So you're never trying to cram your message into a bubble of a certain size. You can expand, you know, you draw the bubble after you've written what you have to say, which I really like because that's encouraging the students, I think, to do more uh, kind of more expansive text types and hopefully write longer sentences. And I would also just say for that one, really important to give a teacher model with what you expect to be in those bubbles. So if you expect full sentences, you need to model for them what full sentences are going to look like. All right. Thank you, Heidi. Of We're going to move on to two more strategies and then I will take another batch of questions. So feel free to ask away in the chat. All right. So we talked about uh, summarizing and note-taking. We talked about comparing similarities and differences. Let's look at one that's a little different. This is a little more metacognitive, reinforcing effort and providing recognition. So 29% increase in achievement. And I teach in a middle school where we talk all the time about Carol Dweck's work around getting smarter and growth mindset. And you don't know how to do this yet. And okay, this didn't go so well. Tell me which strategies you used. Okay, let's try a different strategy and see what happens this time. So I really like the way that this strategy kind of plays with a lot of the messages that at my middle school, we're trying to send to our students about becoming learners. And for those of us who teach the first year of a world language, I think we're teaching how to learn a world language and how to be a world language learner, just as much as we're teaching that language. And so the, the message that I'm trying to give to my students again and again is, you know, whether or not you have this ability to do this, whether or not this comes easy, what we're really looking for is the effort that you're putting in through strategies. So not I spent 10 hours on this, but I chose a strategy that works for me. And based on the result of that strategy, this, this is what happened. And then, you know, I'll say to kids, like, listen, you tried this strategy, like a kid who's using only Quizlet to study for an assessment. I'm like, you didn't do great on the assessment and you're telling me that you got 100% on Quizlet Learn every time. That says to me that this is not an effective strategy for you. I, I would not use Quizlet Live next, uh, Quizlet Learn next time. Why don't you try writing full sentences with the words and see if that makes a difference? And uh, just having like a non-judgmental conversation with students about, it sounds like you need a different strategy. And then just kind of taking a very uh, non-judgmental look at, so how did it go? You tried a different strategy. Wow, you did a lot better. It sounds to me like you found, found a strategy that works. Uh, I think sometimes kids 
who don't do well in our classes think that it's just kind of like a magic thing that other kids are just able to do it. And every now and again, there are a couple of kids who can just do it. But most of the time, those kids are using effective strategies. And I think it's important to kind of make that work visible to other students to model how it is that we succeed in learning a language. Another idea is to do some sort of an effort rubric. This one is taken verbatim from Marzano's book, but there's lots of ways you could set this up. But really trying to get the kids to ask themselves, how, how much did you put into this task? And, and if nothing else, the fact that they're reading the rubric is reminding them of what you are expecting in terms of effort. Did you work until it was completed? Did you push even when there was a difficulty? Did you see a difficulty and not shut down? Right? So these are ways for us to remind our students of the habits of mind that are going to help them be successful in our classes. And I think when we have those conversations around effort, and these will be moments where we're going to probably be using English with our students, and I would say this is an awesome use of our 10% of non-target language, you know, that's really a chance to build relationship, to build that social emotional piece into our courses. And I know at least in my district, that's been a huge focus for this school year in particular. So that was one about effort. And then for the last strategy I want to bring you in this part of the talk, I wanted to talk about non-linguistic representations. So here Marzano finds a 27% increase in achievement, which is, again, quite a bit. And just wanted to think about what are the ways that we ask our students to show us that they understand without having to formulate an answer in the target language? Because there's a lot that students can take in and make sense of that they cannot express back to us in the target language. And we want to make sure that we're making space for that. And I do think in our current teaching environment, it involves um, a little bit of a mind shift, at least for me, to think about how will I know that they got it when they're so far away from me and they're appearing in little boxes. Um, so one thing that I used to do and I still do with success is using different kinds of finger plays in class. For French teachers, there's a wonderful collection of simple finger plays from the Bibliothèque de Lyon where the librarians get on and act out little stories with their hands. And this has a lot of opportunities if you can get your students to get their cameras on and act them out with you, then you might narrate the story and ask the kids to just do the finger play you might put up, put up just one gesture and see if they can, from a list of phrases in the poem or the story, pick out which phrase matches. But there's a lot of ways for kids to use their bodies to show us what they understand. And also for them to start to see, oh, when I, when I do the gesture, I can remember the word more easily. I should probably try to do that as a way to learn words that are hard for me to remember. Gestures are an important part of my memory. Also doing a lot of drawing activities. These work great in a remote environment. Uh, I've been asking students to have a whiteboard at home when possible, but if not, they can just do it on paper. Um, but if I'm narrating something and the students are drawing what they're hearing, and then we get to have that exciting moment where everyone holds up their drawing and we can compare. If you're on Zoom, you could spotlight a drawing and sort of have the class look at one in particular and talk through it, narrate it. That's a great way to, for students to show what they've understood. Here we were doing parts of the face. And so I was saying things like, this person has four eyebrows. This person has two ears. One ear is yellow. One ear is, one ear is orange. And giving the students time to change colors and draw. And then once they've gotten good at doing that with the teacher guiding you, then they might get into pairs and be able to do it like in breakout rooms or just in pairs in the classroom with that back and forth describing. So I find students perceive drawing as a very relaxing activity most of the time. And again, they're able to show so much about what they've understood without necessarily being able to produce words in the language yet. We're, we're on the path, we're always heading there, but we not, might not be there yet. I've also enjoyed in, in terms of kind of replacing like a four corners activity, trying to do things with hand signals or movement to indicate answers. So here we were doing one, trying to figure out what uh, typical ways of meal taking were in our class and then comparing those to uh, kids eating in France. So for example, in this first question, it was who usually makes dinner at your house? And then the kids could just answer with an ASL letter. 
Um, so that was a great way for them to be able to give answers, use some movement, have a purpose for having our cameras on. And then I could sort of be commenting throughout the activity. Oh, I see a lot of people with A's. Those moms are still making dinner. Isn't that interesting that it's 2021 and we still have so many moms cooking dinner. I wonder why that is. Or sort of kind of giving um, a story where you're talking with students about important information for the class. And then for younger learners, I apologize, this slide kind of gives me a headache, but if you teach younger middle schoolers or elementary, having the answers each correspond to an exercise can be a really great way to get them moving and engaged. So I use this activity with my sixth graders. We have a novice mid target. The question was, when do you play video games? And they were answering by season because we were studying seasons and activities. And then, you know, you get each kid doing their little activity and they really have to do it for quite some time as you get all the way around through all the Zoom boxes and sort of comment. Um, and I do think the kids really need to move. It is so much screen time for all of us this year. And I think one way to make it slightly more bearable is to make sure that we're moving our bodies even when we're staring at a screen. So to recap, that was four powerful strategies from Marzano. Uh, we had the similarities and differences. We had summarizing and note-taking. We had talking about effort and providing recognition, being very explicit with kids about strategies to kind of get smart in learning world language and non-linguistic representations. And if you wanna know what the other five are, you should definitely check out the Marzano book. It's definitely worthwhile. Uh, at this point, I'd love to just ask you, is there something that you saw that you might like to try just as a first step to try to bridge this workshop to your own practice? And then if you're willing to share it in the chat, I would love to see if there's anything that that I spoke about that might appeal to you. So I'll just be quiet for a moment and let folks type. Yeah, I just saw a question about the finger plays. So in French, I, I only know French finger plays. Actually, I can think of an English one. Um, this little piggy went to market. This little piggy went home. This little piggy bought meatballs. This little piggy cried all the way home. Like the little thing we used to do with kids' toes where you tickle their toes and tell a story, that would be an example of a finger play. Or in French, we do um, toc, 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 Monsieur Pousse. Et tu là? Shh, je dors. Toc, 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 Monsieur Pousse, es tu là? Oui, je sors, et cetera, et cetera. So any sort of story that has finger movements with it, in French culture at least, there are lots and lots of books for kids where they talk about finger plays. All right, thanks to everyone who's sharing in the chat. I see someone, people commenting on double bubble and drawing and movement which is great. Now, camera is not required. I, yes, someone just mentioned this. This, again, uh, this is back to the serenity prayer. You can't make the kids turn their cameras on. So at a certain point for me, I had to decide how much I'm gonna drive myself crazy trying to get the kids to turn their cameras on and how much am I just gonna try to make it part of the class that cameras are a really important part of what we do and therefore I'm inviting you. And there might be a reason that today your camera's not on and I'm not gonna lose sleep over it or get any more gray hair about it. So, you know, dif different districts are probably gonna ask different things. In my district, we were told cameras on 100%. And the reality is it's, it's not gonna happen. And I'd rather have a kid come to class with their camera off than get into some enormous power struggle with them and have them just tune out to French entirely because they can't handle the camera thing. But yeah, if you're doing an exercise activity and their camera's off, you're not gonna have any idea what's going on. And for kids who consistently have cameras off, we have talked about, you know, you should private message me in the chat what your answer is, because otherwise I have no idea if you're paying attention or not. So, you know, looking for a flexible workaround is probably our best path for like everything this year because you know again grace for ourselves grace for our students there are a variety of reasons that a student might not want their camera on some days frankly there are days that i would like to have my camera off but i can't get away with that all right um i just want to mention also i wrote an article uh, this presentation is based very heavily off that article. So um, we, I think Heidi was going to help me by dropping the link to this article. It's free on the Actful website. It was published in the Language Educator. And if there's anyone who didn't come to this presentation today and you want to share some of these ideas with them, they're all written up with examples. So that is available to you. 
All right, and if there's other questions that are popping up, I will take those now from All right, Rebecca. Yeah, Heidi, what's up? You and thank you for posting the link. Hey, no worries. You've got one that came in the Q&A and Angelica wants to know, what are some logistical challenges you are still facing with the concurrent teaching? Oh, so many. Oh my gosh. I mean, I I don't want to uh, scare you, but it is it is a lot of things to manage at once. I'll give you an example. Uh, okay, guys, we're going to do an activity on text debate. I'm dropping the link in the chat. Oh, right. The roomies aren't on Zoom today. How do I get them the link? Okay, I need to make a QR code really quickly. Let me change my slideshow so that the QR code is posted in the classroom, but I still have the link in the Zoom. So you're trying to, you know, you're trying, and this is the way I'm teaching. I've decided I'm teaching one lesson to everyone all the way through. I'm keeping everyone on the Zoom for the whole 80 minutes. We take a 15 minute break and walk in the middle of class. Uh, I have colleagues who are doing two separate lessons and they do one asynchronous lesson for the kids at home and then they do a, a live lesson for the in-person kids and they really like that because you get to teach the way you used to teach, but you have to create two lessons and there's just no way I can pull that off this year. I have two kids of my own. Things are crazy. I need one lesson. So uh, then you have to make sure everything you're pushing out, how is this done by the child at home? How is this done by the child in class? And, and that for me is tricky or managing two screens. You know, I've got the, the projector, which is showing my slideshow. And then I'm looking at the zoomies on my computer, making sure that I'm screen sharing everything properly. Kids are giving answers in my classroom. No one on zoom can hear them. So I have to either repeat every answer or I do have an FM system because I have a student with a hearing loss in my class. So something I'm looking at, I'm on break this week, but next week, is getting my pass around mic um, attached to a yardstick with elastic bands and then kind of using that like a boom mic in my classroom so that kids in class can speak and be immediately heard by kids on the Zoom. Another one is playing videos. You know, you, you might think, oh, I'm just gonna show this video and we'll all watch it together. But the quality is so poor when it's broadcast over Zoom. It's almost better to share the link with everyone, have them disconnect from the audio on Zoom, watch it and come back. But like middle school, two kids don't come back or they come back, but they forget to reconnect to the audio. So there's a lot of uh, small frustrations throughout the process. And a lot of parallel, a lot of parallel stuff. All right, I want to hop us to the next part of this presentation, uh, just because we have just 20 minutes left together. And this is really staying focused on proficiency, despite this, you know, rather chaotic, complicated learning environment that we're in. And uh, this year, more than ever, I think it is so important that we just see our students' language performances for what they are right now trying not to worry too much about what students looked like last year at this moment, and then think about, okay, so you're in French eight, you're, you know, a middling novice high, what's the next realistic step for you that would move you forward? And, and just trying to sort of meet the kids where they're at and then kind of give them that, ne that next little push. So when I talk about this work, I think it's so important in this moment because there are so many different things to be paying attention to and so many pieces that are in flux. And so if we wanna get really clear on what matters the most, I think it has to be still and forever, what can students do with the language? Like that's, that's the thing that has to matter most about the content of our course. I think above and beyond that is, can we get through the pandemic psychologically intact and healthy? That's, that's the big one. And then when you come to French class, what can you do with French? And that gives us some clarity when we are surrounded by a lot of, a lot of noise. And I think knowing what our target is, is very helpful here. So if you teach a course that has a predetermined actful performance target, that is awesome because that kind of gives you a lot of language to think about where you want to move your students this year. Um, and you might not have that advantage of knowing and, and then there's some guesswork and I think that's okay too. I just wanted to show like a couple examples from just what I've been doing in my classroom the last couple weeks and tying it back to how helpful the actful can-do statements are. And I think Heidi is gonna be able to drop a link for you in the chat that references this 
enormous, very powerful document. And then I just kind of wanted to zoom in on one piece that we could look at together. So what we see here is the uh, presentational communication can do's for the intermediate level. And so over here, we've got sort of our general description of what it means to be an intermediate when it comes to presentational communication. And then down here is the world where I live with my eighth graders, which is intermediate low. I can present personal information about my life, activities, and events using simple sentences, okay? And that just gives me so much information about what I need to be doing in my class. So if we break down what a can-do statement is, it really has three parts, function, context, how well. And I just wanna define each of those briefly so that hopefully as you are thinking about what your learning goals are for the remainder of the year with your students, you can make sure that each of those three pieces is part of your consideration. So here I'm borrowing that function directly from the language that you saw on the can-do statement. Present information to narrate about my life experiences and events, right? So if I'm thinking about presentational communication, one of those language functions is this one. And that's a function that students are gonna see over and over again. That's spiral, spiraling throughout the curriculum. And I know this year I'm really counting on the power of spiraling to get us through that the students are gonna see this again. This is not the only time. And if it's just the first pass this year, hopefully next year will be a little bit normal and they will get a little bit more of this and they'll be stronger in their capacity to, to complete this function. The context, I think for most of us who are teaching novice and intermediate targeted courses is they're, they're, we want them to be able to do this on whatever the familiar current topic is, right? This is not straight up proficiency where we just throw you into the target culture and watch to see if you can survive. This is a classroom environment, which is artificial. And we are building up our performance in certain topics. So if we're doing a unit about vacations, I'm gonna expect that you can perform like an intermediate low when we talk about vacations, which is something that we've done a lot of work on, okay? And then the how well is going to be specific to the performance target. So if I'm teaching intermediate low students, I'm all about getting them to create simple sentences and then eventually to be able to ask appropriate follow-up questions. And I do think that when we get students who are using Google Translate or who's shutting down in face of an assignment, Assuming that they're correctly placed in our courses, which we know is not always the case, but what it is, if we're respecting this learning progression, we're respecting where they are in terms of the performance targets, we should be able to get a decent performance out of them. And I think when we, when we face those challenges, often it's because one of these pieces is kind of out of whack and is too much of a stretch. So if we're disappointed that our students aren't running, writing paragraphs, well, maybe we need to remember that they're only intermediate low and really all we can expect fairly is simple sentences. So that can also sometimes help um, deal with what can feel like some of the disappointment of teaching in this moment where students can't do everything that they might've been able to do at this time last year. So here are the key pieces of having a can-do statement. And then I just wanted to show how you can take the existing language from the can-do statements and customize it to your context. So here are some sample can-dos for intermediate low presentational. And then I'm just circling the pieces that I'm gonna kind of steal as I write my own can-do. So they're talking about, okay, intermediate lows, they can write descriptions. They can write about plans. They can talk about vacations. They can talk about places they visited. Okay, so I am going to write an appropriate intermediate low can-do statement that is not on the official document, but that is customized that says, I can write a description of my ideal vacation using, using simple sentences, okay? So that's what I'm gonna be working with on my students. And then I just wanna show what that might look like in terms of all the scaffolding that I'm providing to students this year. So I wanted to get kids talking about ideal vacations. We had watched a very fun, silly music video about a French girl describing her ideal vacation and a silly pop song. And then I started off by just asking my students on the Padlet, can you give me five emojis that represent your ideal vacation? So again, that's that non-linguistic representation. You can see here some of the emojis that students shared. And then we started to write sentences that describe those emojis. And you'll see on the right, there were four categories I wanted them to write on. And for each category, I gave them model sentences. I gave them a word bank of possible answers. And I'm just asking them to choose 
Where do you go? I go to this place. How much time do you spend there? I spend a day, a month, a weekend, this kind of thing. So really, really scaffolded language initially as I'm building them toward the, the capacity to communicate in simple sentences. So then we started to have a pad that looked like this, where students have their emojis and then they have their sentences, some of which imitate my models a little more closely than others, but they're doing this in real time. The Zoomies and Roomies simultaneously are typing on that Padlet, and then I can be making comments. Okay, I see a lot of people are forgetting that when we talk about a country, we put en in front of it. So let's just look at some of these examples. Okay, Patricia voyage en Espagne, Emily voyage en Belgique. So it's a nice way to kind of watch them write and give feedback in the moment. I've got my example down here for them. I'm always trying to model for them what I expect. And then once they're able to write those sentences, that is preparation. Now let's have a conversation. You're gonna interview your partner in a breakout room and you're gonna ask them these four questions. Oh my gosh, they're the same four questions I just asked you when you wrote your Padlet. So you already know the answers, they're on your Padlet. So again, really scaffolding every piece. You know, What do I expect? I expect that your cameras will be on and you will be unmuted that you will start by greeting each other by name and that you will take turns asking and answering in French. And when you get stuck, here are the two words that you're gonna to use to get unstuck so you can stay in French with your partner. So we do a lot of just really making it clear what the expectation is and only advancing a tiny, tiny bit at a time. From there, we might be ready to work on some circumlocution on the same unit. So here's an example. Uh, at this time in previous years, I was able to play taboo very spontaneously with my students and they could sit in class and half the kids could face the board and half the kids could face the back of the room and each partner facing the front would see the list of words and they would just spontaneously be able to describe them. This year, my students are not at that level of language performance. So what would a scaffolded version look like? Well, it would look like a word bank of here are all the words you might wanna describe. It would look like, here are some sentence starters. If you're describing a place, you might start with, it's a place where you, if you're describing an object, it might begin with, it's a thing that you. So giving the students the sentence starters they'll need, and then also giving a few teacher examples. So this was just a way to, to still get at the idea of circumlocution and letting students sort of play that game, but in a much, much more scaffolded way. And uh, when I think about this kind of assignment, my sort of metaphor for it is belt and suspenders. So whatever it takes to keep the pants up, we're doing it this year. You can't provide too much help. You look chic when you do both, right? This year, our students need a lot of scaffolding and I don't think we should be shy about giving it to them so that they can do something with the language in our classes. So once the students had written their scaffolded taboo uh, clues, then the next step I could turn the comments feature on on Padlet and have kids guess what do they think their classmates were describing. And then we could just have a nice class discussion about, oh, look, Alden says it's hot and yellow. You look at this during the day. People think that's the sun. Alden, how'd we do? Oh, we did great. Okay, super, we know that one. Um, and just again, sort of introducing students to conversation about the language, giving them a lot of repetition of the structures that we use to circumlocute. And then at the same time, getting really, really familiar with the vocabulary from the unit. So that's just another example of sort of bringing students into intermediate, keeping that eye on the proficiency in terms of forming simple sentences and doing it in a very purposeful way that lets us move forward in one of our thematic units. I also, just in terms of this belt and suspenders business, I'm gonna share with you, I think Heidi will put the links in the chat again, please. Um, these are strategies that I've developed for each mode of communication with my students. And basically I just found myself when we were doing interpretive work, I was giving the same advice during office hours to struggling students again and again. And then eventually it was like, I should just write this all down and then I will have it when a student needs it, when a parent needs it, when a special educator needs it. And so what I do now at the beginning of the year is I just photocopy this all on cardstock and the students keep it as part of their permanent documents that they keep in their binders all year long. 
I allow them to reference this at any time. I encourage them to have them out during assessments. And so this one on the left, don't worry about the tiny print. I know you can't read it. This one on the left, interpretive, breaks down the basic parts of the actful interpretive section of the um, integrated performance assessment, things like um, keyword, important phrases, main idea, purpose, and just give student strategies for how to attack each part of that process. Um, interpersonal is getting students to work on their interpersonal speaking through the context of the TALK rubric. TALK is an acronym that stands for um, text type and talking in the target language, accuracy, listening, and being kind in the sense of keeping the conversation going without taking over the conversation. So this is just all my speaking tips for students about how do you prepare for a spontaneous conversation. And then this last one is when students are doing presentational writing work, basically just really trying to get them to focus on leveling up with introductory, concluding, and connecting phrases that bring their language to that next level. So again, I think trying to be super explicit with students, like this is not magic that some kids just are able to do this. There are a certain set of strategies that we can deploy that allow us to uh, coach up our language performances. And these are the strategies that I want you to use in this class. So I'll just share those for you uh, in case they'd be a helpful reference. We have three questions in the chat. Yes, tell me. Uh, or I should say in the Q&A. Do you let students work on assignments during the class period sometimes? Yes. And certainly all assessments they're taking during class. And uh, recently, I'm trying to do at least one on-demand written assessment in person so that I really know what students have up here and, and what they can produce on their own without help. Do you use vocabulary from the French textbook or do you use your own list of vocabulary that works with the particular activity? So we don't have textbooks anymore in my department. We decided to write our own thematic units and I do have core vocabulary for each of those units. The way I give students vocab is I say, these are the words that you're responsible for understanding and producing. These are the words that you're responsible for understanding, but you do not have to produce them. And then I give them a blank table where I say, this is where you should write down other words that you think would be helpful to know for this unit. And when we're looking at authentic resources, I will encourage students to add to that personalized vocabulary. That becomes a major criterion for leveling up from intermediate low to exceeding the level when they're able to incorporate the personalized vocabulary. We have uh, two more questions here. I see, uh, what are your current go-to tech applications, platforms for student sharing and collaboration? So Padlet is a big one, just because it's easy and straightforward. Jamboard, but more when I make a copy for each student, because middle schoolers tend to like to mess with each other's stuff when they're all on one shared Jamboard. And then I've been doing a lot with Nearpod out of Google Slides so that I can see everyone's work at the same time during class and comment on it in real time. There's a question about how much English do you use in class? More than I ever have before and ever want to again. Uh, my goal is still 90% and there are tech issues and me muted and forgetting that I was giving directions when no one could hear me kinds of things where I find myself slipping into English to kind of get through that part of class so that we can get back to the good stuff. Okay. Can you see yourself using this intense scaffolding even when we return to in-person? Some of it, yes. Those strategy documents that I shared with you on the previous slide existed before this year. And I think this year we're just relying on them more heavily. Given how few students are in front of me and how little of their attention I'm able to capture when they're at home, I feel that the belt and suspenders is needed now, but I'm hoping that when everyone is in front of me in person, please in September, that it will be belt or suspenders. And that, you know, by halfway through the year, maybe it'll be sometimes a belt and sometimes suspenders. 
And I see that um, we had another question. At what point in the teaching about vacations do you do this very scaffolded writing? Is this towards the beginning of the unit or closer to the end? This is towards the beginning. This was after a couple days that were very input heavy, where we were having fun listening to this pop song and sort of making guesses about the vocabulary in it and then trying to transfer what we understood from that song to what we want to express ourselves about our own ideal vacations. Very good. Do, do you control your final exams at the end of the year or do, does your county? Yes, in New England, our school districts are tiny. Mine is just my little town of 30,000 people. And uh, I'm the only person who teaches this course. So I'm the only person who's giving a final exam. And I think frankly, this year we won't have final exams. I don't see how that could possibly be a good use of our time. But yeah, we have a very proficiency focused um, performance assessment that in the past we have given as a final exam. Okay, and um, I see two more here and we'll have to conclude shortly because I have to share a link with the group. Um, would you repeat the talk representations was one of the questions. Oh, what talk stands for? Yeah. Sure. Um, target language and text type, accuracy, listening, and being kind. And if you Google talk Blue Wolf, I have a extensive blog post where I explain in great detail how I use that rubric with my students. And um, any quick list of some pop songs with video? Um, the two that I use for this unit are C'est les vacances by, by Ilona Mitresi and um, Ma vie au soleil by Kinve. And for French teachers, if you go to my blog, this whole unit is explained in great detail and there are links to all the authentic resources that I use as part of it. It's the unit called Les Loisirs, Leisure Time. Very nice. Thank All right, you. so I know we're going to have to wrap up. Should I hop through a couple more slides and bring sure. us to the end? Yeah, mm -hmm. okay, good. So I'll just mention when you um, come back to the slide deck, you know, there is some information here about using a single point rubric as a way to give students very clear feedback that really targets the level. And I think that's just another way of drawing their attention to what are the things that I'm looking for. So rather than having a million levels on one page, can you just have the target level and let them know you met it, you exceeded it, you partially met it, or there's not enough evidence for me to say. So that might be something to take a look at um, when you have a little bit more time. And uh, I th we had some questions, so I think that's good. I just wanna make sure that everyone has access to the survey exit ticket, which I believe is gonna be posted in the chat. Uh, I know I would appreciate your feedback and I'm so glad to have had this time kind of learning with all of you.